just before we start today's business, I would like to make a few remarks. In recent days, we have passed a number of important hurdles in the debate on Scotland's constitutional future. The two governments have reached an agreement. The Section 30 order has been laid before both parliaments, and this parliament has established a new committee which has now had its first meeting to look into these matters. There is a great deal of interest in the work of this parliament from both within and out with Scotland. It is therefore important that we set the correct tone in our debates and in our other parliamentary engagement. Members will recall the words of our first First Minister, the late Donald Dewar, when he made his opening speech to this Parliament. Donald Dewar said, This is about more than our politics and our laws. This is about who we are and how we carry ourselves. I agree. This is Scotland's National Parliament, and as such, the presiding officers are determined to ensure that the public is proud of the manner in which we conduct ourselves and engage in the challenging issues ahead. I am confident that we will have the support of all parliamentarians in this. Finally, let me say a few words about the use of language and conduct and the conduct I expect of all members in this chamber. While context is critical, there are certain words that I consider to be unparliamentary by their very nature. I recognise that some members will seek to be creative and we will therefore make our judgments according to the circumstances at that time. However, whilst we will not seek to inhibit debate and the legitimate holding of government to account, I remind all members in this chamber to consider very carefully their choice of words and the tone in which they have been de delivered. We now move to topical questions. Question number one, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In declaring an interest as a farmer, may I ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the threat to forests from ash, dieback, calaria, fraxinia? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I would like to thank the member for raising this issue. The, the Scottish Government is extremely concerned about the threat from ash dieback and is, are working closely with the UK Government to try to eradicate or contain the disease. On the 29th of October, the UK Government imposed restrictions on imports and movements of ash plants and seeds into and within Scotland and the rest of the UK. Ash planting had already been suspended on land managed by, by the Forestry Commission Scotland. Ash dieback has been identified in one site in Scotland's National Forest Estate and all the plants were removed and destroyed. A second planting site in Scotland is now under investigation. There has also been one confirmed nursery infection in Scotland and all infected trees are to be destroyed by the end of October. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's estimated that 80 million trees could be infected in the UK with this disease. What steps has the Scottish Government taken to assess how many trees could become contaminated in Scotland? And I'm grateful that the Scottish Government is collaborating with the UK Government to determine the best course of action. But could you tell me how many trees are at risk? Paul Gilhouse. Uh, certainly, I um, understand that something like 1% of Scotland's tree population is uh, made up of ash trees and uh, there is a substantial area um, under cover, so 11,700 he hectares of ash in Scotland alone. It is uh, not the, the largest tree species in Scotland, but it is clearly an important one for the, the biodiversity of our, our, our national forests. Surveys are underway on, of all other nurseries and planting sites with plants uh, from potentially infected sources since 2007 and of ash sites identified with potential health issues during the National Inventory Survey and the Native Woodland Survey of Scotland. Uh, earlier in October, Forestry Commission Scotland issued a briefing advising woodland owners and managers of the threat from cholera dieback of ash, and advice is also being provided on, the, on alternative species suitable for planting on native woodland sites. John Scott. Thank you. Uh, so I was going to ask, what is the Scottish Government doing to make the public and owners of trees aware of the disease, its signs and symptoms, and given the difficulty of identifying the disease in the autumn months, does the Cabinet Secretary, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, now wish he had made Parliament aware of the presence of the disease in Scotland before now? Minister. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the issue you raise about awareness of the disease, it's worth pointing out that um, 
Scotland first suspected the disease in July of this year, uh, whereas it was actually in England suspected in February and confirmed in March. So we had no reason to believe it was actually present in Scotland until, until July. It was only confirmed in August. Uh, thereafter, we took very decisive action in terms of removing all infected trees from the National Forest Estate site that I'd identified at uh, Kilmacoon uh, in Renfrewshire. Uh, as to uh, regret for um, not making it aware, I think prior to now, it's worth noting that initially the disease, when it was first identified, was, um, it was mis misunderstood. It was anticipated it was actually a, a different fungus which was causing the, the problem. Therefore, there was a delay in terms of recognising it as a, a fungus in its own right. And obviously, thereafter, action has been taken both at UK government and Scottish government level. Claire Baker. I ask the Minister that in light of, there are, I mean, you'd be aware that there are newspaper reports that the Forestry Commission was aware of the threat of Irish dieback back um, as far back as 2009. When exactly the Scottish Government and the Scottish Forestry Commission first became aware of the threat of Irish dieback and what action was taken then to stop the disease spreading? Minister. Um, <clears throat> You are correct in, in, in the assessment that uh, Scotland has been aware that, of, the, of the disease. Uh, there is ongoing work obviously, to identify exactly how it has been transmitted both to the UK and uh, within the UK. Uh, it, it, as I said earlier on in response to John Scott, uh, the first uh, example of the disease being identified in Scotland happened in July and confirmed in August. So, um, up until that point, there was no um, uh, evidence of it having, having been present in Scotland. We're obviously underdoing extensive survey work now to identify exactly how extensive its uh, presence is in Scotland. And uh, all I can assure the member is that we will do absolutely everything we can to, to, to move forward and try and uh, effectively manage the disease and try to eradicate it as best as possible. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. One high-risk pathway for the disease entering the UK is on imported ash saplings. Many of these are actually trees of Scottish provenance, but grown in Europe before being imported back, and, pot and potentially with the disease. It would seem more beneficial to support such sapling nursery business here in Scotland. What can the Minister do to support this industry, especially now the import ban is in place? Minister. Well, uh, Alison Johnson raises a very important point. I think it wasn't necessarily understood that the, 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 the infection that took place recently was actually seedlings which were taken onto the continent and brought back. So you're quite right to raise that issue. Um, we're obviously trying to make people aware uh, out there in terms of buyers that, that this is actually a, a quite well-established practice that seedlings are grown on in, in the continental Europe and brought back. So to, partly it's making people aware that that is actually a risk, that people might not be aware that um, seeds germinated here, transported to the continent and then brought back are actually a potential transmission source. But as I say, we're trying to understand exactly how the disease is transmitted. There is a suspicion that it may well actually have been brought over and it can be carried in the wind up to 20 kilometres at a time, as I understand it. And uh, speaking to researchers at Forest Research this morning on a visit to Roslyn, uh, they were indicating that it's still uncertain exactly how the disease is transmitted. And so we need to do more work on that through uh, Forest Research and other agents to, to identify exactly what the risk is. Question two, Christine Graham. I thank you, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government when the Borders Railway will be operational. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, we expect to make an announcement with regard to the Borders Railway shortly once the commercial terms of the contract between Scottish Ministers and Network Rail are finalised. Christine Graham. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer, a tone of which is very different from the negativity of the Conservatives, in particular Mr Lamont, uh, who is forever going on about it, and I suppose he'd have a different tune if it was going through his constituency. In any event, that wasn't our fault, that was Liberal and the Labour uh, Party who decided that. But on a positive note, because I'm a very positive person, would the Minister be willing, even if it had an effect on price and time, to consider cross-party and local campaigners' views on accommodating charter trains, given the additional potential economic benefit to the borders? And can you also give me a further update on journey times? Minister. Yeah, can I thank the member for a question. And as you will know, um, I had a productive meeting with both uh, Christine Graham and with uh, Claudia Beamish, uh, and with representatives also from the campaign for Borders Rail earlier this month on the matter of tourist trains at Tweed Bank Station. Can I say that I took that uh, proposal very seriously? We've had further discussions with Network Rail. And as I said in the answer to the first question, we are in the process of completing a further assessment. Uh, we will have a further meeting with the Campaign for Borders Rail, hopefully in November. Uh, and as I say, I expect to make an announcement on our agreement with Network Rail shortly. In relation to journey times, I can say, uh, as I've said before, that there is no change to the proposed journey times. Uh, the 55-minute th journey time previously uh, given uh, as the target remains. 
Uh, within the network rail contract, the specified journey time for the new section of railway remains unchanged at 44 minutes. And as I say, the fastest end-to-end -end journey time of 55 minutes also remains unchanged, and it's my intention will be achieved. Christine Graham. Oh, I, thank the, I thank the Minister again for his answer. Okay, while he's doing this, will in fact charter trains, uh, will that make any difference to the regular running of the trains, or are we looking at something at weekends, Saturdays and Sundays? Will it impact on, for instance, commuting? Minister. Yeah, I think, again, that's an important point, but one which has to be uh, discussed uh, further with Network Rail and, obviously, with the eventual operator, ScotRail, because the uh, possible synergies between uh, ScotRail and Network Rail and making sure this service can happen are very important. But it's obviously more important that we do have the standard services delivered without interruption. But I think, as uh, both Christine Graham and Claudia Beamish have said previously, there can be substantial economic benefits from these charter trains, so we want to make sure, if it's possible to do that, that we do, at the same time as having no effect on the regular running of the trains. John Lamont. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the leader of the SNP-led Scottish Borders Council, Councillor David Parker, has indicated um, that he's happy to see the costs of the railway rise Regardless, um, or regardless, he's happy to see that the railway um, costs rise, even um, provided the railway get, gets built. Does the minister agree with that analysis? Minister. I don't even agree with the terms of the question because, of course, David Parker is not an SNP councillor but an independent uh, councillor. Uh, but can I say that it's never going to be the case that we'll be happy to see an increase in the project costs for any cost. For example, we are bearing down very heavily on costs in relation to the fourth road crossing, and we have done so on previous projects like the M74 and also the Airdrie to Bathgate line, recognising, of course, that rail projects tend to be more challenging uh, sometimes than road projects. So we're not complacent at all about the cost of this, and we'll do all that we can to drive down costs. Although to go back to the original point made by Christine Graham and has also been made to me by Claudia Beamish, if there are additions that we can make to this which would help the economic uh, uh, situation in the borders, then obviously we should look at that sympathetically. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, may I welcome the remarks made by the Minister in relation to charter trains from the, um, on the basis of the cross-party discussions that we've been having. Can I also ask um, the Minister... Um, if it's possible to clarify how Transport Co Scotland plan to ensure the accessibility of all stations for bus users, pedestrians and cyclists. Minister. Uh, yes, Claudia Beamish will know that many of those issues are still under discussion, but for example, park and ride facilities are an integral part of the project. And obviously it's the case that instead of, as we're having to do across Scotland, sometimes retrofit uh, accessibility to stations, they should be built in from the start as part of this project. And just in passing, if I can thank uh, Claudia Beamish for the constructive approach she's taken in relation to the Borders project. Aline Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The role of authorised undertaker is being transferred from Sc uh, Transport Scotland to Network Rail, who are also providing finance for the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme. Can the Minister advise whether there is any connection between Network Rail taking on the role of authorised undertaker for Borders Rail and the £350 million reduction in funding for Egypt between 2014 and 2019? Minister. Uh, none whatsoever. Of course, it's the same body, but the decision on the Borders Rail was taken substantially before the decision on Egypt, so there's no connection between those two uh, projects uh, at all. It is the case that both of them will result in a combined project of approaching a, bill, a combined investment of around a billion pound in Scotland's railways, and we're very pleased to be working with Network Rail on something which will so advantage the people of Scotland and public transport networks. 